Uh, welcome to uh, VCF Midwest 2.0, right? I'm Jack Rubin, um, Tom Uban, Dan Cahoe, Jay West. Um, we are all addicted, or afflicted, I guess, with a, a problem about collecting computers in one way or another. And uh, I think we'll find a sympathetic audience. So we just kind of wanted to share some of our problems and, and probably some of the good sides of this, too. Um, I don't know, I can't promise anything for Tom, but I, I think this is not going to be quite as technical as the, the prior hour. Um, what I'd like to do is have the four of us just kind of go through this. I got a set of questions, basically just a, a first introduction about who we are, uh, and you guys, again, can play it any way that you want. But um, what you do, how you got to where you are. One of the things that, that I'm interested in, just to kind of kick this off, is stuff that happened really kind of the period you guys were talking about or maybe a little bit earlier from the early 70s to the late 70s that 72 to 78 time frame or something when um, a lot of computing still was very much dependent on who was sitting there and what they were doing it wasn't just an out-of-the-box experience you built what you needed you fixed what you needed and you had some kind of end in mind that um, you developed the original title when I was thinking, or when I was told I was going to give this talk alone and before I revolted, uh, I, I just uh, said that I saw myself still as an end user after all these years. Uh, I was, and, and I'll just talk about my experience. In 72, I was a grad student at the University of Chicago. Um, I was in the Department of Anatomy and uh, Evolutionary Biology. And I used computers as tools. I had some work to do. I needed to get some answers. And actually, as a grad student, because I was one of the earlier com computer users in my department, uh, mostly it was a bullshit machine. So when my thesis advisor said he needed some more data or what was going on, I'd sit down and bring him a couple inches of green bar. And they said, hmm, that looks pretty good. And you know, they didn't know what I was doing, and neither did I. Um, what eventually happened, and I think it happens to a lot of grad students, is I became ABD which is all but dissertation. I passed my prelims, but I ended up going off into the computer world. Uh, again, really kind of as an end user. I was never working at the level you guys were, but um, <coughs> I hooked up a little company called US Robotics and ended up running their data center for a few years. Um, and somewhere in the mid 80s time frame, there was an article by Stan Veet in the old computer shopper saying, welcome to the 10th anniversary of the personal computer. And he was talking about the Altair. And um, that got me thinking about it. I said, geez, I better start collecting some of this stuff because it's all kind of going away. And that was the start of my collecting. Uh, swap meets, ham fests. I actually ran an ad in Computer Shopper saying, if you've got old stuff, please let me know about it. And um, on my table in the other room, I've got a Selby sitting there, which was one of the first things that I got as a result of that ad. And that was, a, I think, $25 plus shipping. So that kind of got me hooked. Um, and I think it still is the machine that I like the most because, again, at that time, that was really one man's vision. A fellow named Nat Wadsworth was a, an engineer for General Datacom in Connecticut. Um, and he was a pretty serious guy because he had a, uh, an AD at home in his basement in the early 80s. I'm sorry, early 70s. Um, and started looking at these microprocessors. And he built what, and you can get into all these arguments about what came first, but certainly a very early, if not one of the first, 8,008 home machines. Um, and that's what that Selby is uh, on the other side. And he built a company, uh, he and another fellow named Bob Findlay, they got a grad student from Wyoming, Mark Arnold, who wrote Selby, their basic compiler, or basic uh, interpreter to run on the machine, and built a little bit of an operating system. Uh, Nat had a couple heart attacks, and, and really, um, for health reasons, the company folded. They ended up going into printing, into publishing, and his textbooks that he had written in the hospital became really the money makers for the company. At the end of the day, they figured they'd probably lost about 500 bucks a machine when they were in the hardware business, but the publishing business worked pretty well for them. And the cool part for me was being able in 1985 to get in touch with these folks. I sat down, you know, had dinner with them, did an interview, um, learned about the machine. And so it was, it was that piece of really 
not just the hardware, but a piece of history. And the same thing, you guys, you know, you're in there, you were in Maynard, you were talking to the folks. Um, and and I, I'll just let you guys pick up from there. But it's, it's that part of not just <coughs> having the tool, but of understanding it, of being able to mold it, make it useful to yourself, and also understanding some of the context and, and the human history that makes collecting a lot of fun for me. Yeah. About, about that time frame, do you remember something called an Intel X8? Absolutely. It was a, it was, I think Intel built the thing, it was an 808 microprocessor, like a demo kit. Right. And it had some small amount of RAM in it, it had switches to thumb in program, no, no boot prompt or anything. And so you interface to TTY, and you had to you know, thumb in your bootloader to load a paper tape. Right. To, to then, and then my, my DE267 project, Professor, I took it from Dr. Dave, Dave Meyer, was to write a bootloader that could be a high speed tape reader and it was using files on the P9 and the thing had no disk and it was just a ramble thing and a calipite. Yeah, in fact, if you ran their compiler, their assembler, yeah. it'd probably take you half an hour to run the three passes of paper tape through that thing. Because you'd run the tape and you'd generate a table and you'd you know, well, go back. Well, actually, they ran on disk on the PDP-9 with our compiler. So it ran pretty well and punched out tape for, for the output. And then, and then we, had a, we actually had a tally, paper, uh, tally reader to read the high-speed tape. So it wasn't awesome. that bad. And that was my, my class project to get that to work with. The tally reader wasn't even photo dials. It was mechanical fingers. You had to start the motor up. Put a, a buzz loop, a spin loop, get the motor up to speed, advance the tape, stop the tape, push the fingers in, you know, debounce the signals <laughs> as the fingers hit with software, you know, pull, pull, pull the light in, you know, pull the fingers up, turn the motor on to advance it for the next frame. And, and so we had this loop motor that was set up in high memory, you know, for months, you know, without because it wasn't turned off. And then somebody clobbered it for part of the buzz loops. I remember without coming the, the bootloader back in, what happened was they put their paper tape in the tally and, and they hit go and what the thing did, the motor came on and put the fingers down, let the fingers down, and the motor ran full speed, the tape went in, and the sawdust came out the other end. Yeah. Um, the first machine I had was a uh, Data General 0800, and we bought it piecemeal because we didn't have money. So it had a teletype. <coughs> paper tape reader. And we had a high performance uh, compiler, the uh, Fortran 5, with a five pass compiler. This machine had 4K memory, 4K words, I uh, think. And we were really lucky to get programs through the thing that compiled because of the errors in the paper tape readers. Uh, it was 50 50 chance to actually get a program on the computer process. Yeah. Well, and again, um, at the time I was working on this stuff in the early 70s, it was a neat kind of contrast because we had an 1140 in the lab. Um, there were eights all over the place. Uh, Wadsworth's development machine was an eight, and he was he was cross compiling. He so he had an 8008 cross compiler running on the PDP eight that he ran back into <coughs> the the Selby. Um, but people's you know, it was a full thesis to do a Fourier transform or. or uh, spline function, I think. Things that, that we take for granted that are library routines or ROM routines took years of work to get going. And the same kind of thing, you just, part of the of getting it going was making the machine work. And when you talk about getting the system stable, you'd, you'd turn stuff on and if it worked, you just kind of stay there until you were done or it crashed. Uh, you know. That's the reason we got this thing, because we couldn't get a job through the Temple Computing Center, the PDC machine. Yeah. yeah, you get to know your machine. Back in that era, also, there was 
some software showed up usually on paper tapes that made use of specific hardware rotating bits around and the radio frequency radiating out to play music so they could actually write a music compiler by spinning the right bit patterns around in registers and, and things like this and you just take an AM radio and, and tune it you know across the band and, and I remember we had some program on the PDP-90 played Star Spangled Banner that showed up you know like it would tell 10 kilohertz increments all, all across the band and there were stronger spots and weaker spots depending on you know the hash but it was actually pretty good music for uh, you know just just a you know EMI interference coming out. Well, and that's the same time when, as long as you had a maintenance contract, you could do interesting things with a printer, too. <laughs> so, um, Tom, why don't you jump in? Uh, I guess I started doing computing stuff back when my brother was in college. He's uh, eight years older than I was. And he had an account on a Play-Doh system, which was which, uh, uh, ran on CDC machines. And uh, it was a real-time multi-user system. And there were terminals all across the Midwest here, at least, anyway. And they were real time. They updated like every 50 milliseconds or something like that on a 512 by 512 plasma display. And so you can imagine what everyone did with that. They played games. And that was great when I was uh, you know, in high school. We'd, we'd go over to the local university and hop on the computer at night and, and play games, it's, you know, dogfight and air fight. And, and uh, there was a game called Empire where you where, which I think later became, you know, it's one of these multiplayer strategy games where you get together and join up with one of the one of the, the teams and drop bombs and load armies onto planets and take over the world and stuff, or the universe. And so that kind of was my kickoff to, to playing with computers. And I later went to college here at Purdue and worked at ECN alongside with George and Mike and those guys and uh, watched them develop the VAX 780, the Duel. That was great fun. Um, I was doing mostly uh, printer repair and, and terminal repair and such, all the thousands of ADM 3A and 5 terminals, fixing those things. And Have you got a cover for my ADM switch plate? No, probably not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and uh, Printronics printers and, and uh, uh, impact printers for different departments. And then eventually I moved over to uh, the physics department across the street, which is where Mike used to hang out a lot, I guess. And uh, I was their uh, Unix administrator for a while, and we ran 2. Point, Berkeley 2.9 on a, on a, what was it, 1140, I think it was 1144, and we also have an 11750 running uh, a, a standard VAX distribution of uh, BSD. And uh, from there I moved on to working at Gould in Champaign-Urbana, and that was about the time just before. When you went there no, it was actually Gould when I went to work there. I'd previously, Compion. The formerly, company, they were totally Compion, formerly EPI. Right. There was a whole slew of. Uh, it was a great place to work. We worked on Unix kernels, and uh, I was primarily a software person. Um, and and the machines we developed there ended up being ones that George used here. There were the ten the ten uh, MIP or ten ten MIP uh, ECL machines. Uh, so. Oh. Yeah, fire breathers. They're huge machines as far as power. I remember uh, down the hall at ECN, there they had a couple of machines in there, and there's this two-inch conduit, steel conduit, going down the hallway that had the power running into the into the phase uh, makeup converter device. And they had I don't know how much current was going there, but the thing was hot in the in the, in the winter time. You could hang your gloves on that pipe and, and dry them out because it was so so much current going through there, it just heated it up. And John Fraser had an MP1 in his basement in New Hampshire. Didn't have a zero heating bill because it was a little paper to run the machine. He was going to put a Weber air conditioner in his house for the summer. He was like one of the first telecommuters, I think. <laughs> uh, let's see what some of the other stories of uh, and how I got into the collecting of this of this stuff was. Uh, I remember seeing George up in what was the name of that room? The three thirty. Yeah, three thirty eight. He used to sit up there a lot, and there was an IMLAC that he had as a console. Um, for the 1170, and that was great. And next next room over there were a couple more MLACs, and and uh, I brought my MLAC here last year. I didn't bring it this year. I probably should have, but it's kind of big and clunky to move around. But it was a graphics vector display device that had a dual processor, 
and it plays games, of course, which is what attracted me. Uh, so yeah, Space War, Maze War, uh, out at VCF West. Is it called West? It's just primary VCF, really, right? VCF. It's a couple years ago now, we, uh, we re redid Maze War, which was one of the original multiplayer games. Um, and we had, we had a setup where my Imlac was playing Maze War. We had a version of Maze War that, that uh, one of the original writers of Maze War, Howard, uh, I forget his last name now, Howard um, developed uh, in Java to run on a PC. And so we had a bunch of, pe bunch of PCs running Maze War, and it was all hooked up on a, on a network connected to a PC emulator of a PDP-10 that was running the, uh, that did the code that, that actually uh, Did that run on Baltics or whatever? No, it ran on one of the, I think it ran on one of the tops. Yeah. Tops 10, wasn't it? I think so. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, and that, that was a central server for all the, uh, the star, the star connection. Um, so, so I guess my, my collecting days started with the MLAC. I still have the MLAC that I bring around. I have a num number of PDP 10s or 11s and such. Um, later I went to work for uh, BBN where we developed massively parallel computers and I have some of that stuff um, and then the gaming thing finally caught up with me and I ended up working on pinballs for uh, Williams and Valley and developed pinball games for seven years before they shut that down that was one of the best times in my career life and uh, that's about it well, that's when you meant Duncan hmm? that's when you meant Duncan yeah Duncan used to work there right yeah you know Duncan yeah okay so uh, that's about it for me. All right. Well, Dan. <coughs> okay. Well, I uh, speaking of technical, I'm absolutely not technical. I'm the, I'm sure I'm the least technical of anyone in the room here. Um, my current job, I'm actually a hog procurement manager for a major meat packer in Canada. So, I <laughs> I'm in the other world. But I started out in 1966 in in university with a uh, General Electric time sharing on a ASR 33, that was my first uh, computing. Uh, our projects were do whatever in basic using the, the teletype and it was, uh, it was entertaining, it would make a lot of noise and, and fun. Two years later, I actually got into the program, it was a business program at the university I was at and uh, I'm not sure how it happened but they had a brand new IBM 1130 in our computing room for the exclusive use of the business students. So. That was, uh, that was a good thing. Uh, computing students really were bugged by this because we had our own key punches sitting right beside the machine and the printer, everything was there. Uh, there usually wasn't even a system administrator there, so there was no problem with creating Fortran decks. You just type up whatever came to mind and feed it into the machine and it would reject anything it didn't like and in less than a minute you could have a new card put in the deck and try it again. The, the computer students had 24-hour turnarounds on their decks and of course uh, <laughs> so occasionally we'd see them showing up just to run a compile on a deck. At any rate, uh, that was where I, get, I guess I got enthusiastic about computing and uh, did a lot of stuff in the, in the two years there using Fortran. Then got out of it. I, I know I tried to buy a PDP-8 in about 1974 for a real business use, never got it finished and then started into uh, microcomputers with uh, Radio Shack or TRS-80 Model 2s in the, in the, at the time they came along and of course then went through the rest of the sequence into PCs and so on. Uh, my biggest problem these days is trying to figure out how to make Crystal Reports do what I think it should but anyway uh, about five, six years ago I got enthusiastic about looking back to the old days and seeing what I could find around. I'm not sure what, what was the first thing that I, I made me do that, but I know I drove to Cornell with my wife one winter day to pick up some <coughs> HP uh, 9300 from uh, Carlos, uh, who's Carlos, who's now in Colombia, he's on the list. Um, Probably on a couple lists. And, yes, I'm sure he is. Anyway, he was in computer engineering at, at Cornell, and that's really where I, I got my first machines. And that was just a start. I guess I got really enthusiastic after that, and and uh, I have a, a small <laughs> a small collection now of stuff. Uh, every so every couple of months, we have to buy a new semi-trailer or build a new building. 
So, um, and I guess that I, to hold my stuff, yes. I, <laughs> I, uh, Jack has been there recently and has seen the horrible truth. Small is a euphemism. Yeah, small is a euphemism. I, uh, sometimes people bring their wives along and usually what happens when they leave they say, I'll never complain about my husband's collection again, having seen yours. <laughs> At any rate. Well, the primary building is a pole barn that uh, <laughs> was about 20 by 40? 30 by 40. 30 by 40. Um, 20 feet high? Something like that. And Floor to ceiling. <laughs> Not on shelves, just stacked. <laughs> no, it is on shelves, but the interspace oh, the between the, where you might run a forklift is now filled up as well. So. Do you have a forklift? <laughs> no, I couldn't get one in. Got an uh, electron microscope. That should give you some idea that he starts talking about <laughs> forklifts when he's talking about his collection. Anyway, um, and I, uh, the, the questions, the pre-prepared questions here to help us along our way on this little discussion were things like, what do you collect? And I guess Frankly, I collect just about anything that I see as being at risk. Uh, so I really look for stuff that, while it may be too big or, or isn't a complete system or whatever, I see it as something that will never be, will not be around any longer unless it gets taken care of by someone. So uh, I'm truly a hoarder, I guess, which is a, a really bad thing to be in this, uh, this collection business. But, you guys will all thank me 25 years from now when you want to find something and, and uh, you call me because I probably got it. Um, I see a lot of things. You, uh, uh, we talked about the RP04 discs uh, this morning earlier. Uh, I got them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> sometimes. Uh, that was plural. <laughs> uh, People spe uh, specialize, and I think that's uh, that's a good idea. And I do have some favorite things, and in fact, I'm probably slowing down on what I bring home. Uh, but things like the uh, 1120s and the early uh, Novas from Data General, uh, I have an old Donner analog computer that I think uh, are interesting. And those are the things that, when I get tired of bringing stuff home, I'm expecting that I'll spend some time on and, and make them work. That's that's my concept. At least that's what I tell my wife. The other question was, what would you most like to add to your collection that we had here? And I think an IBM 1130 still would be my, my favorite thing to have because I spent so many hours with it way back when. Uh, one of the things that I think I'm really good at, uh, and, and I've got evidence for that, is that I actually have a pretty good network of places and people that will call me if they see something or have something that they want to get rid of. And I, I, I read on the classic computer list, people say, well, there's nothing old out there anymore. All the good stuff's been collected and, and so on. And, and I don't think that's true at all. I think there's still a lot of things out there that it's important that people as a group look around for and, and get under protection before they get scrapped. Uh, and we're going through a classical one of those scrap times right now where everything is at risk because of the extreme value of scrap metals. Uh, I've been surprised. Copper, scrap copper in our area is worth close to three dollars a pound. Scrap, not not new copper, and uh, so you can imagine that a lot of the things that are sitting in someone's backyard or in junk junk man's a scrap man's place are very much at risk right now to be melted. Um, but I had a little list of things that I think are useful in terms of how you do find things, from my experience. And uh, just going down that now, the first thing is you've got to ask questions of everybody you see. If you run across somebody at a party, the first thing you do is, hey, <laughs> do you know anything about this? The other thing is you need pictures of, of some of the stuff that you're looking at because a lot of the computers that people like me would be looking at, in, in, if you say, hey, have you got an old computer? Well, of course, they're thinking that the 486 that somebody is dumping is just what you're looking for. Um, People don't know what old computers look like uh, if, they're, if they're not in the, uh, the enthusiast uh, section of, the, of that part of the world. Uh, you need to follow up carefully and regularly. If someone offers you the PDP-8 along with the 486s, you cheerfully say, thanks a lot, I love all this stuff, load them all up and take them away. Don't go and say, the rest of that stuff's crap, I want your PDP-8. You've got to, people have gone to hard work, if they've done this, they've looked around for you and said, 
I think Dan might want this stuff. I'm going to save it. Don't kick him in the shins when, when they make a mistake. You want people looking for things for you. Uh, I also believe in the, uh, the old thing about if you find even a, the power cord for uh, the most unusual machine in the world, take that home and label it because the rest of the machine will be attracted to it. Uh, sometimes you've got to pay. And especially if you're dealing with salvage and scrap people, if they have something that's semi-attractive that they've actually saved for you and possibly called you about, and it's 300 bucks and you think it's worth 10, some days you're going to pay the 300 bucks just so that they'll call you again. The other thing is, yeah, I think it takes at least three visits to somebody to make them believe that you're serious. You know, not just some crazy guy that walked in off the street. So you've got to go back a month later, two weeks later, whatever. You've got to show up two, three, four times. By that time, they either want to find something for you to get rid of you, or they've started to think, yeah, I guess that guy really does want this stuff. Or he's really crazy. Or he's really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other thing is to keep thinking about all the different places where this stuff will be um, and, and follow up on those things. Once you get them home, I think it's important to catalog stuff. And my wife's just retired, so I'm certain she's going to start that soon. Uh, <laughs> and uh, storage is pretty critical because I, I have lots of experience with pulling these things out of uh, old semi-trailers that have been parked at the back of a farm or some junkyard or something. And, a lot of stuff seriously damaged by humidity, by rodents, and, uh, and other depredations of the world. If you're going to get it home, make sure you've got a good place to keep it. Measure the humidity, keep it warm, above freezing in winter. So there's some cost to doing this, but it's important, otherwise it will continue to deteriorate. And finally, find good homes for the stuff with people that really need it. I collect stuff so that it's there. I need, to, I need to find people that actually will use some of it, so, because it's no good sitting in my barn. Anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and the, another thing to add to that, too, is when you find stuff, if at all possible, you want documentation and software. Absolutely. And that, uh, that's, so many of us have things that, what does that do? How do you, you know, sometimes you can reverse engineer it, but it's a whole lot easier if, if you got the docs. And of course, with the net, um, things have gotten so nice over the last five, ten years, the list that we'll talk about, uh, but the number of sites <coughs> where, I mean, I've spent the last two weeks printing PDP-8 docs from BitSavers. Uh, the pile's about that big now. You're the one chewing that band <laughs> up. Well, I was been, looking for you. I've been a computer refuge a little bit, too. Um, Jay, jump in. Sure. Um, my name is Jay West, and uh, contrary to what my name tag says, I'm probably best known for running the classic computer list. Um, that I, I recognize a lot of faces that I've seen on that list. But uh, if there's any folks here that are just kind of curious about the hobby, looking to get into it, check out uh, classiccmp.org. And uh, there's a mailing list, basic website. At the very least, it'll get you pointed in the right direction for contacts and things like that. Um, how did I get started collecting? Um, I, I think I hear a recurring theme about most of the collectors that I talk to, and it tends to come down to nostalgia. Most of us are about the age where we're in this industry, we, we, that's our, what our day jobs are, and we remember cutting our teeth on such and such a system You know, when we first got started. Um, the, the first systems that I had exposure to was uh, at my high school. We had a Hewlett Packard 2000. Uh, access system uh, running Timeshare Basic. Um, we also had a PDP 1103 running RT11 with TSX Plus extensions. And uh, that was the two main computers. They had probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 terminals scattered throughout the school, um, mostly MIME ACT terminals. Uh, there was a few uh, LA120s uh, around the school as well. And I think they had a uh, uh, Heathkit Analog EC1 computer. Uh, there as well, which at the time frame that I was in high school, right around uh, 80, 82 time frame, that was kind of unusual for a high school, at least in my area, to have that type of a, a computer setup. Uh, but when I went to high school, I was all set on being a um, 
heart surgeon, and the first day I walked into the computer room in the high school, it was, that's it, throw that out the window. This is what I want to do. Uh, so I went into the industry, and, and that, that's the day job, so to speak. But um, how that dovetailed into getting into collection uh, was um, one day, I'm guessing this was about seven years ago, six, seven years ago I got into collecting, was um, I was downloading a update for um, Windows Internet Explorer. I, I don't recall exactly why I was doing it, but I was downloading this update and it was something along the lines of 20 megabytes. And I just got really, really indignant and said, now hold on a second, the, the computer that I used in high school had uh, 32K of memory and a five megabyte disk, and that supported 32 users, their database, the operating system, the whole nine yards, and it did it quite well. And uh, that actually made me think, okay, it's time to stick my head in the sand and go back to when computers could actually do, you know, real work with a certain amount of hardware. So uh, when I decided to get into collecting, it was the HP 2000, that's what I went looking for. Um, and they were actually fairly popular in educational institutions, but for whatever reason, there was not much of them around. Um, unlike the deck boxes that were very, very common, you know, both in educational institutions and also in, you know, mainstream data processing, the HP 2000 was pretty much targeted towards um, educational, very beginning educational system. When it booted up, you were thrown into a basic interpreter and that was it. There was nothing outside of that. Um, so most of those systems kind of disappeared and it took many, many, many years to, to find all the bits and pieces, the microcode necessary. Um, but I finally succeeded. Uh, I do have a running HP 2000 uh, access system. I actually have two of them. Each one's a dual processor system. Um, I also have a 2000E running. And um, to my knowledge, and I, I know most of the people who are interested in that type of system, it's the only one that is up and running on original hardware. Um, I do know one other collector in California that is very, very, very close to getting one up on original hardware as well. Um, I know that there is a lot of people that are running that system on emulator. Um, SimH is a, a common emulator that people are using to, to run that OS. But since it took so long to find all the bits and pieces because that system was comparatively rare, Somebody offered me, I believe the first system was an 1123, and I thought, well, you know, if I'm getting into this collecting hobby, I don't really know much about an 1123, but I might as well take it. And uh, then somebody else offered me a uh, PDP-8 uh, at the time, and uh, I think that's somewhat unusual these days, but a, uh, I had started looking on the internet um, on some of the uh, mailing lists and news group, and... Um, found several places where people were talking about this crazy hobby of, of actually collecting some of this big iron. And um, some guy popped up and said, hey, I've got a PDPAE and I'm getting out of collecting. Um, uh, actually, I think he was moving overseas. And he de-racked the thing, uh, put it in his vehicle, met me halfway, you know, TU-56, PC-04, um, PDPAE with, uh, you know, a decent section of memory and not only did he give it to me but he spent the morning unracking it and driving halfway uh, so uh, uh, collectors tend to pass around these systems that many times are worth a lot of money because they their their primary focus seems to be making sure that these things survive um, so along the way even though my my focus was the HP systems um, I've actually acquired a, a fair number of deck PDP stuff uh, several 34s um, my current restoration project is a PDP 1145. Um, so if anybody has any ideas why it always traps to, to interrupt location zero, I would love to know because that's where I'm stuck with that machine. Um, after, the, machine. after the 45 gets done and out of the workroom, um, the next projects I've got for restoration is um, I've got three data general eclipses that I'm trying to get into a running system, a uh, microdata M2000, and uh, that's about it. Then, uh, then I've pretty well got most of the, the systems that I'm looking for. Um, you coming to zero or two four? I mean, uh, I, I put it on a shelf. Most early PDP 11s was you know four, and we took the new program counter out of four and, and went to that location, and maybe a zero and four, so I, I haven't looked at it recently, but I think I've I haven't looked at it recently because I've been stuck, but as I recall, what I was seeing was it was actually halting at four, and everybody said that meant it was actually trapping to zero. 
And it seems that any time an interrupt is generated, it always does that. And I've tried generating interrupt from three different devices, and every one of them always traps to the same location. You have a single step switch on there, I think on the 1145. Mm -hmm. You tried single stepping it through. I did several months ago when I worked on this. And, and it was at that point where as soon as the interrupt happened, it always got a zero for the, the vector that it was hitting. I don't know why. I'd love to know. So something on the CPU card set itself, rather than a Unibus problem, or well, uh, one of the the kind people here has given me a card set for my 45, um, a spare card set. So I'm going to actually try the the. I'm sorry, Tony, but I'm going to try the quick and dirty board swap route. He's not here. Okay. He's uh, listening. But... Yeah, I'm sure he's hearing me somewhere as soon as I say board swap. So um, let's see what else. Um, what is the system that I would most like to add to my collection? Uh, as I said, I, most of the systems that I've been collecting has been um, for nostalgia. I cut my teeth on them. They're one of the first systems that I used in college. I used some data general stuff. That's why I, I decided to get the Eclipse. Uh, but there's other things that have come in that I really had no intention whatsoever of getting that have suddenly decided to occupy space in the basement. Um, one person posted on the classic computer list years ago when I first got involved that they had a fairly substantial Heathkit collection and that it was going in the dumpster if somebody didn't grab it. Well, I looked at his email address and, and uh, back in those days people were using small regional ISPs so I knew that he was in St. Louis right where I am. And I thought, okay, there's a guy in St. Louis that's going to get rid of some Heathkit gear. Um, and I had never messed with Heathkit other than um, uh, when I was young and drooling over, you know, issues of byte and datamation and saying, okay, what kind of computer can I get? That was one of the ones that I was staring at all the time, you know, hoping to get. And um, this guy, uh, I sent him off an email and he said, sure, come on over, you can grab it. I've been collecting Heathkit for years, I've got tons of this stuff. And uh, I said, well, do you think it'll all fit in a Camry? And he said, no, it's a little bit bigger than that. You might want to bring something else. And I, I thought, well, I can borrow one of my uh, father's vans. And he said, yeah, it'll fit in the van. <laughs> so um, I, I said, I'll be there in 20 minutes. And, you know, he sent me an email back, got his phone number and all that stuff. And um, four van loads later, <laughs> I, I had this stuff all uh, in, in my house. And there is the Heath kit. Most of the stuff was originally sold as a kit. And I have got board after board after board that is the original kit. The original parts unassembled in their, in their bag still, you know, with the instructions on how to put it together. Uh, several H8s. Uh, no H11, though. Um, so that's the one part I'm missing uh, out of that. But I, I literally have a room and a half, maybe two rooms, and one wall of my basement that is floor-to-ceiling Heath kit. I mean, magnolia drives, you know, just stacked up. Um, stuff that I really didn't have any nostalgic interest in, but hey, I, I got it. So uh, um, I, I was more concerned, quite frankly, that the stuff would get thrown out, and I knew that there would be, you know, people in the future that were looking for that type of thing. So uh, you would be surprised when you get into the hobby how much stuff you start accumulating that you really had no desire or intent to uh, to ever take care of. Um, the last uh, two things that he had on here uh, for the questions I'm trying to go down is. Uh, what is the future or fate of my collection? I would love to set up a museum. That's my hope, my dream. I don't know if it will ever come to fruition. Um, but I would love to set up a museum to exhibit uh, these things to the public. Um, I think that too many times we've got uh, uh, kids playing with computers that uh, really should get some type of appreciation of the heads and shoulders that they're standing on when they uh, write that cool visual basic script or something. Um, as an example, my brother-in-law graduated from uh, a fine, prestigious university with a computer science degree not too long ago, and he really doesn't have a whole lot of concept of, you know, what a UART is, and it's like, I, I just don't comprehend that. I mean, nowadays they're coming out with, you know, programming is their, their big specialty, and uh, it's not like the old days where when you were working on a system, you had to know the software and the hardware and all that stuff together. Now they're kind of specializing in, in each area. Um, but I would like to set up a museum that is actually uh, 
running systems that kids can come in and actually touch, play, maybe have a Saturday seminar where kids can come in and you show them the basics of machine language, you know, just like a five instruction program or something. Let them enter it on the front panel. Let them read the results out of the register, you know, just so they have some idea of uh, uh, how things really work, you know, instead of you just turn on your PC and Windows boots up on the thing. Um, and then lastly, the, the future. What does the future hold? I am very curious and interested in knowing what other people think of that as well, uh, as far as what the future holds for this hobby, because, uh, as I say, most of the people that I've come in contact with, it's all nostalgia for what you cut your teeth on. Well, those people are getting older, and there's kids growing up who didn't cut their teeth on a, you know, a PDP-8, and a modern system with all the surface mount technology and stuff, it's not something that they can really dig into and, and get into the guts of it. So um, I'm, I'm kind of curious where the hobby will go you know, as, as folks like us start getting older. But not old enough to know better. Yeah. Get older. Right? Yeah. Um, is, there a, is there a need for uh, people to keep this old hardware for you know, archival purposes? Uh, the issue I'm talking about is uh, media deterioration. Yes, there, there is active, active people that are working with that. BitSavers is one example. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. Uh, uh, Al Caso runs uh, bitsavers.org, which uh, hosts untold huge amounts of documentation on the old deck stuff. Um, there, I know there's print sets, schematics, um, uh, microcode listings, bootloader listings, you name it, it's all being preserved on there. Um, and actually, I think he's, if, I don't look at it that much, this section of it, but if I'm not mistaken, he's also got stuff on test equipment, tech, tech you know, test equipment and stuff like that. Some little data I.O. prom programmers and things like that. Um, Yes. There, there's folks that are doing that. Al is also moving into the software side and yeah. starting to archive software bits. Uh, he's really focused on the printed documentation, but now he's getting into the, the operating systems and stuff like that. Of course, we have to be careful of the, the copyright situation and make sure that we respect all that stuff because some of it is still you know of concern uh, when it comes to that issue. but. As an example, on um, a PC that I have at home, I've got a half-inch tape drive that does all the different densities, a paper tape reader and punch, um, and uh, also things like uh, QIC80 drive, uh, five and a quarter floppy, uh, three and a half floppy, uh, four millimeter DAT, and it's primarily because you know some collector needs a paper tape. Well, they'll scan it on their reader, on their PC, ship it to me across the internet, and then I can take it and send it to the paper tape punch, get it out, and okay, now I've got that priceless boot tape, you know, for, for uh, or the cross loader for an HP 2000 that nobody seems to be able to find. So, yeah, there's very active uh, efforts underway to preserve the software side as well. Yeah, Al's actually associated with the Computer History Museum yes. in California and is now a curator there, so, so he does seven track tape, reading in and all that stuff. And didn't he just posted to the list about a um, uh, an analog device he's building that can read <coughs> pretty much any tape format? Yeah. yeah, he's been doing that for a while. He had that for a deck tape for, he fixed, he fixed a deck tape uh, amplifier set to do that, read tapes that have become so decrepit that they wouldn't read on a regular drive. He's probably done that for other drives too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that a lot of us here and, and in the room see ourselves in a sense as curators of this stuff. Um, even though Dan describes himself as a hoarder, he's more than generous and very open about what he has, willing to you know, share bits and pieces, information sources, all kinds of things. Um, another piece that is both nostalgic and, and contemporary is there's a tremendous sense of community. And certainly if you were computing in the 60s and the 70s, you needed other people to help you out or you were helping other people out and what you knew you trade, you know, there was a lot of, of communication and sharing back and forth of just sort of the black art of getting this stuff to run. And I think that a lot of that still goes on in the contemporary group, and I think that's, that's what a lot of the satisfaction is. There are people, and, and I know I did this in, in the old days and I still do it, you kind of break protocol every now and then, and you got all these nameless or faceless names. Um, I call people, and some people get very upset about that. It's like, are you trying to, you know, do something <laughs> personal here with. But most people are real, real generous and, and real helpful. 
Um, when I got started in the early 70s, uh, I was in Chicago. Seven, some winter of 79, the Chicago BBS came up, uh, and the Hyde Park BBS was, was really useful to me. I ended up, you know, I, I didn't just sit on the phone at 100 baud, 110 baud, or 300 baud, but I was picking up the phone and meeting the sysops, um, hooked up with Ward and Randy, the, uh, the modem guys, Ward Christensen and Randy Seuss, um, and it was just a tremendous entree into a lot of things. And then the computer clubs that were active at that point. Um, for cash, which is the Chicago area computer hobbyist exchange, and it was a, an exchange of legitimate and illegitimate stuff. Um, meetings, I think we used to meet once a month, and there were a couple hundred people there. I don't know what was going on with homebrew on the West Coast, but I know here in the Midwest, we had lots of people coming out all the time, active on the air, and again, if you're used to internet speeds and you got to just kind of throttle back to character at a time, 300 baud, and you know, you could just about type as fast as the, the modem could, could work. Um, it was a different time, but you were looking at 3K, 5K programs and not the, the kind of stuff we're doing. But uh, yeah, I, I think the sense of community and the sense of being part of a, a, a flow, a stream of stuff that you're bringing in, that you're taking care of, that you're rescuing, that you're restoring, and then hopefully it'll go back out again in, in some kind of useful way. Um, that, trip, that tripped off another memory I will relate as far as uh, one of the reasons why I do this. Um, it, nowadays, the, you see some of the code that comes out, and I distinctly remember sitting, pouring over assembly listings, looking and saying, you know, if I change this to an indirect reference, I can save two clock cycles, I can save three instruct." that doesn't happen anymore. I mean, now the code that comes out is, uh, uh, well, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> you got a problem? Buy more rent. Yeah, yeah. So just, it, it, it's, to me, part of it is a bit of indignation that I want to go back to the day when you actually went through the code and tried to make things efficient. And I feel that that's a lost art that's uh, disappearing. And, and uh, uh, so that kind of dovetails into the nostalgia of it. But that's another reason why I do it. And that reminded me of it when you mentioned it. What about input from you folks? Because we're just you. You're, you're us. I mean, you know. We're... I would like to make a comment. Um, it, as I talk to people searching for things in my collection, um, I've talked to a couple of people who their spouse used to collect computers and they passed away, and they had no idea that this was a big hobby out there. So they took their entire collection and threw it in the trash. So just kind of a comment to everybody. Make sure your wife or husband or kids know what to do with these things if you do pass away. Don't throw them out in the garbage. Because I have seen, talked to two people that that's happened to. Uh, just make sure that everybody knows that there are people out there collecting. Should be organized. I, I, will, I will relate. I'll, re I'll relate a story along those lines. I decided that it might be a good way to protect my collection if I let my wife know that certain of these pieces are truly worth a lot of money. I'm sure a lot of you guys watch eBay and you know what some of these machines can go for. So I, was, I started down the road of telling her, don't throw that system out. I've seen those go for two grand, three grand, you know, stuff like that. It backfired. She, <laughs> she started saying, how come you aren't selling it? So, uh, just as a word of caution, don't go down that path. <laughs> Any other comments or thoughts, questions? I, don't know, I, I just think it, it's a, a great, great hobby. It's a lot of fun. You meet a lot of good people. Um, you drive a lot of miles. <laughs> drive a lot of miles with big trucks. <laughs> and uh, yes. make U-Haul real happy. Uh, make the storage, happy, the storage people real happy. Uh, and it's not all about the big gear either. I mean, there, I, I myself tend to focus on gear that happens to be fairly large, but there is a lot of folks in the hobby that are, you know, dealing with small single board computers, uh, uh, the older personal, you know, computers, your Tandys, TRS-80s, Ataris, and stuff like that. So it, it's, it's not all about just the big iron. Um, I didn't say anything about big iron. I just said lots of storage lockers. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, I, I got a little story along the same lines about wives and stuff. So. I've got a uh, ECS core stack of control data machine that sits in my basement. And my wife kind of looks at that and wonders what that is. And I told her, there's an ounce and a half of gold in there. So, <laughs> 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 the uh, first cyber tool closet we had here, 
when I got rid of that a couple years ago, you go out and take this for another country or something, right? You get on any mail these days for three and a half million investments. The deal I got on Sullivan was 10 grand because of the gold. That was my bid, too. Purdue Salvage didn't have any transportation boxes right here. I don't know if those pieces of that still sitting out there or not. No, it finally left when they closed down out there. There was still that rack there when we were out there last time. There was still the. It was like a rack that was empty of stuff. No, when we were out there, but not in the new location. No, when we were out there, it's a couple yeah, years we now. But well, they already pulled most of the gold component out of there, so you end up with these big vacuum chunks uh, and lots of wire and stuff that sat around until uh, they had to close that down and move. All right. Um, I don't. Is Patrick here to tell us to stop? No. <laughs> It's one oh, no, he left. All right, well, it's, it's time to stop, so. We'll... <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Thanks, guys.